Ladies and gentlemen, Lost Ark's beta is coming to an end, so that means it's time to drop our final thoughts. We put three members of the team on this with a combined 200 hours played. But when Amazon reached out to us to check out Lost Ark, as you can probably imagine, we had one big question on our minds. Let's get into it. Okay, before we get into even covering the game, we need to address the giant elephant in the room, and that is, of course, the pay-to-win ideas of Lost Ark. No doubt, similar to me, the first you even heard of Lost Ark was when it was announced it was coming over to the West. This is not a new game. It has been out for several years over in Korea, and immediately videos started to pop up about how pay-to-win this game is. And no doubt you watched videos like this with reactions and all that kind of stuff that went very widespread, and the game was declared dead on arrival. So it's important we talk about this, because not only in every stream chat and even in-game, because they were giving away keys in the stream, it's been the dominant conversation about this game. So we've done our research and we should explain exactly what's going on because I have one simple rule when it comes to companies reaching out for us to look at their games or look at their products is that I will not advertise anything that I would not advertise to my kids. That is my simple rule and it makes our choices really, really easy. And I would not advertise, say, a very, very pay-to-win mobile game that seemingly is attracting uh, lots of whales and using horrible terms like that in order to get things done. That isn't this. So listen a little bit longer and maybe it'll make sense because a lot of the arguments I've seen in game are very misguided or based on the Korean version, which is not this. In fact, the first question when Amazon reached out to us that we asked is, what are you guys doing about the pay to win stuff? Because it's a big deal. And they replied quite forthrightly, explaining to us that, yeah, they've done a lot of little development in order to modify the game for the Western market in terms of its gameplay structure, but a big part of it has been removing and reworking the game without the pay to win elements. They then released a big blog post explaining about it, knowing that after videos like I just mentioned surfaced, they were going to have to deal with this scenario because it was already ingrained in so many MMO players that it was just a pay-to-win game. And they've done that. Have they removed everything, though? No. No, they have not. So let's clear up exactly what's in here because that's going to help you out with making some decisions. What can you pay for? You can pay for some gameplay bonuses. You can pay for things like your pets in order to acquire, give you buffs, some armor sets to give you buffs. And more importantly, you can pay to have a lot of the research and resources that you need in order to upgrade your very end game gear happen much quicker and much simpler. Can you acquire every single one of these things in game without much effort? Kind of, yes. For the most part, Yes, like the vast majority of it you can do. The issue you're going to run into is when you get to seriously pushing the limits of a character. Now, that is when you're going to encounter what is considered pretty normal for Lost Ark across every server, is that you can either go free-to-play entirely, because this is a free-to-play game, but you're probably going to need several alts, or at least want several alts that are feeding your main character, maintaining them and keeping up with them. Very similar to a Warlords of Draenor in WoW scenario, where people had several garrisons in order to feed one character money and resources and things like that. The alternative is somebody can open their wallet and do that on one character far simpler and far quicker, and maybe even have the edge on you. But you can achieve everything in game. If this is your main game, you're probably not going to have much of an issue with this process. More importantly, who does it impact? Now, this is where it also fits the line for me for the reason I'm actually sat here. What about PvP? Because, of course, people have lots of horror stories about PvP and certain pay-to-win games where somebody gets overly buffed, they pay money, they get super powerful, and they just smash you into the floor. Does that happen here? No. No, it doesn't. PvP is normalized essentially across the board, which means your gear is irrelevant. There's one map where you can do some guild versus guild stuff where you can... Uh, very selectively fight certain people and then you can have your gear be your gear but for practically every single player of this game it is not an issue in pvp so you don't need to worry about that what about in pve well obviously if someone's got certain combat bonuses they're going to be slightly more ahead of you and i say slightly we're talking a couple of percent here and there does that affect anything not really because dungeons are all co-op experiences Raids may die a few seconds earlier. Now, the only place I can really see this being a thing is if a competitive PvE situation develops within the game, which, of course, as we know from a lot of MMOs, is crazy, crazy niche. Now, as you guys know, I'm a big supporter of competitive PvE. 
I don't think it has a place in Lost Ark, which is why I'm not particularly bothered about this system. So the amount of people who may be impacted by the ability to quickly upgrade your gear to some slightly, and I mean slightly, higher item level, which is giving marginal DPS increases, is extraordinarily niche. For everybody else, if you do bump into a player who does that, who does 4% more damage than you, you might finish your dungeon 30 seconds quicker. Something along those lines. Something really non-essential and not relevant, which is why I'm okay talking about it. It does exist. That's the, the bottom line. It does exist. My personal opinions on this, though, it has no need to exist. I think it's just going to be a big black mark on the game for a lot of people that it exists, it is there. Does it affect people? Not really, but it's still there. And we have in the West many proven models that don't require or don't have any form of pay to win in them at all. We've seen lots of lots of free to play games that have used cosmetics and really cool stuff, especially because they do have the ability to decorate and build a giant stronghold for your characters which a lot of people would enjoy massively, and we've seen that work, even if those microtransactions get a little bit more expensive. And believe me, I fully understand that a free-to-play game, especially one with this level of quality, because it is a great game, does need some way of finding monetization. I'm always going to be against, though, anything that actually affects gameplay, because even though I can sit here and tell you it affects a potential, currently non-existent, very niche amount of people, that temptation is there, and that's where the worry is, is that guy has more than me. He has it easier than me if I just throw down a few bucks. Not a big fan of that. Never have been, never will. Having said that, I've said a couple of times now, this is a really, really good game. Let's go check it out. Now with all that said, let's get into the game, because as I said, this thing is really, really good. Like, surprisingly good. I didn't know what to expect from an ARPG MMO. No Holy Trinity, we don't have the tank healer DPS, we do have dungeons, we do have guilds, we do have raids, all that good stuff. So we divided up our duties covering the game into th to three people. I spent my time going through the story, taking it time, listening to the cutscenes, exploring the world. I eventually got a boat, which I didn't know was coming, I'll get to that later. Uh, one person went straight to the end and started messing around with endgame, and our boy Nups went and tried like every single class. Because the real core strength of this game is its classes and its gameplay. So we should start there because that is easily the most fun part of Lost Ark. Um, one thing that really we all agreed was just fantastic is something that's not in the Korean version. And I really hope they do not change it when it when finally does its full release. And that is when you choose a class, and you guys have all been there, where you... You have a general idea of what you want to play. So for me, it was melee. I wanted to go melee after our recent caster look at Path of Exile. Um... But I can read the spells, but I'm not quite sure what they do, right? You guys have been in a scenario where you'll read Shield Charge. And in one game, Shield Charge sends you 40 yards and barrels you through 50 enemies and smushes them to pieces. And then in another game, it's more of a Shield Bash that kind of stuns an enemy. But they're both called the same thing. So what they did, actually, was you pick a general melee class. Then it puts you into this subclass choosing area where you can spawn bosses, you can spawn mobs, and you can freely swap between all the classes and gain their spells and get a quick feel for which one suits you. And this was amazing uh, for all of us because we were like, mm, that one's okay, that one's, oh, this is the one for me. Uh, and I really, that does exist in the Korean MMO, in the Korean version, but you have to do a bit of a tutorial before you get there. In this version, it just throws you straight into like, okay, like try out your classes. And this little tester period is, mwah, I want to see that in so many more more games. I really, really do. So once you've picked your class, the gameplay is everything in here. And there's been some debate about people comparing it to Path of Exile and Diablo in terms of the gameplay. But the gameplay here is king. It's absolutely king. Because it's the stuff you're doing in the game. The actual buttons you're pressing are all meaty. The sound effects are perfect. Their impact is crisp. What you're not doing is building like an overgeared character that just spams a couple of buttons and just eradicates the whole universe. Um, what you're actually building is combos and stringing abilities together and then specking those abilities out to work together in better ways and also being able to, and you can just completely respec whenever the hell you feel like it for free. Uh, oh my heaven, my heaven uh, for that opportunity. And what you actually do in this game is you will get like 16 skills, but you can only have eight equipped. And then when you level up, you gain points to invest in those skills. So in here, you don't have a talent tree, essentially. What you have is a skill tree. 
And each skill can have three modifiers on it. So you might pick up something like a leap attack. Once you invest four points into that, you can then choose a modifier for that. Perhaps when you leap, you gain a bonus attack speed for seven or eight seconds. Perhaps you generate extra resource for your ultimate attack. Perhaps you move further or you leap further on. Perhaps you land with a crashing assault. Then when you do seven, so you pick one of those three, then when you invest seven points, you unlock another few, another row of abilities. So you can choose something else out of there. Perhaps create a shockwave when you land. Perhaps it now happens much quicker. Things like that. And then when you invest ten points, which is the maximum, you unlock the final version of it, which may thrust spikes out of the floor. It may radiate impacts across the room. And what I found is because you can freely, impact, uh, freely swap around, is once I could have actually get an ability to its maximum ten-point potential which requires several levels to get there, is I was just messing around with them. I was like, okay, what does this ability do? Because you often get abilities that some of them are great from the outset, and then some of them are like, oh, that feels a little weak sauce. And then you can go, well, let me try out what its final version is and mess around with that. And then if you like it or don't like it, you can either keep it or you can move it away and try something else. Uh, that is like the crux of the entire game. Uh, it's, it's easily the best selling point of the game is the classes. The classes are really fun. They're completely over the top. They're completely ridiculous. But each of them plays in a way that is so fun and so satisfying that everybody we had playing here, especially Nups, who was charged with trying out all the different classes, was like, I just want to keep doing this over and over again. I just want to play more and play more and play more and just kill more things and kill more things. Uh, so it's... I played Berserker. We had Shadow Hunter over on Top Keg and Nups played like literally everything. Um in order to test these things out and it was all absolutely fantastic i loved how I, the gameplay the gameplay the actual gameplay loop what you're doing in game uh and the classes are on point like very very super impressed with that system let's move on to the leveling then so the leveling is where they i think i feel like they've still got some things wrong and they can make some modifications here uh we all universally agreed that there's just too much downtime and not enough killing. The XP gain in the game is really heavily weighted towards quest completion. And mobs will give things like 2 XP, you know, 2 to 4 XP. Quests are going to give you several thousand. Um, and so you're really heavily incentivized. And I, after we all played separately, we didn't work together. But we all universally, after a, a few levels, just mounted up and walked past enemies just to turn the quest in and move on. Uh, which... <sighs> Nah, not a fan of that. I wish it was more balanced the other way. Uh, this game does not need side quests. Uh, each map uh, is just... Each area you move to has like three story quests and then you move on. Um, and so what you end up doing is getting the story quest, going about your business, which often has you only killing like three or four enemies for the most part, and then just mounting up and riding past all the enemies in the game, where the, the fun of the game is from killing things. So it would be really nice to have more combat opportunities uh, I would say each zone could do with upping its mob counts significantly and its respawn rate and allowing you to really chew through enemies because the gameplay is so good that the questing often and the quest leveling, which you have to do because it's where the bulk of your XP is. Eh, I mean, let's talk about the story a little bit and we'll come back to leveling. The story is passable. Uh, it, it's designed to get you from A to B. Now, as the name suggests, you're looking for the Lost Ark. Okay. Uh, it's not the most amazing story. I will say it has some of the best set piece scenarios i've ever seen in the mmo uh now regardless of the story these things are worth playing the game for regardless it is free to play uh the castle siege which i know is spreading like wildfire after people have seen it is just how good this is is the best combination of cutscene with interactive gameplay i've seen in years it's amazing it's so fun to do and they actually have several more of them as you move through the game that are as good and it's really worth playing the game just to experience that but the storytelling and dialogue is very it's okay it's serviceable right that's about as much as i can say uh coming back to the leveling then as i said the zones are a little bland i was really hoping for more to do in each area or map but you are there for a really short period of time if you're actually not interested in the story and you're spamming your action buttons to just get through the dialogue you can spend like 15 20 minutes in a map and then you move on to the next one uh and that's it there's lots of them but you're you're there for a very short period of time and then you move on to somewhere else which doesn't allow you to really to get to know the area to have any affinity for the area and uh, they don't have a huge array of environments either uh so there's a lot of like forest a little bit of desert but then you kind of back into less dense forest forest a bit of a jungle area so there's a little bit less 
varied than I would like to see in an MMO. I'd love to see like a volcanic area that was really intense or some really frozen wasteland areas that you tend to see or a really ethereal area. Uh, things like that that give you that good sense of memorable environments. But for the most part, the zones are... A little bit samey. There's some really nice quirks and twists, certainly as you get later in the game, where you'll do things like you'll shrink to the size of a fairy and you'll be running around boots and, you know, rats now become a giant problem. That's very cool. And that was the first time I was like, oh, this area is actually kind of fun. But before that, I can't really say I had a memorable experience with the zone and would love to have seen more variety in that. Um, but overall, the leveling is fast. Certainly if you aren't interested in the story and you end up do skipping if you are a skipper you'll you're going to realize that levels come really really quickly and what surprised me actually most about the leveling because I, I didn't research lost dark so i could get a blind impression of it from a fresh a fresh set of eyes is the after about level 40 the game massively opens up because you get a ship and i wasn't expecting this at all and you get a ship and you can explore lots of islands and you can find side stuff and you go sort of archaeological digging and the whole game just opens up into a massive exploration thing. Up until that point, you kind of just go from zone to zone to zone. Uh, just go map, next map, next map, next map. And then suddenly the game just goes and just kind of opens up into this entire mass thing uh, to deal with, which was very cool. One thing that I actually adored and was so surprised by was the dungeons. The dungeons are incredible. They're really well done. Those were memorable environments compared to the actual leveling zones themselves. I look forward to every single dungeon I went to. What I really liked is they had four difficulty options. So you had normal, which was then split into normal solo, where it was scaled so you could solo it. So if you were just a solo player looking to get along with the story and you wanted to go and do the dungeon, it was perfectly easy. It was nice and relaxing. You could just go and chill in there. You could enjoy the story. You got to see the bosses. Then you could do it with matchmaking, so you could have it with four players. So you can obviously bring your friends if you want to. Then they had hard mode. The only difference was, obviously, it's more difficult and more dangerous inside. Uh, but... The it can, it can drop a couple of extra items. Can do. It's a chance when the boss dies to get some extra items. And once again, that is soloable. So if you're more engaged with your gameplay, which I, I can't imagine you wouldn't be playing this, uh, you could solo the hard mode, and that was really fun. And towards the end, I started every hard mode, or every dungeon I did from, say, the first 30 levels, uh, just doing matchmaking, because of course I wanted to play with other people and see what that experience was like, and it was really, really good. Um, but later on when I tried to solo them, what I actually found is you have a much more engaging experience. So I did both. Like, after about level 30, I did hard mode with a group, which was really fun, and then I did hard mode solo, which was really fun. The engaging part is, because of the lack of the Holy Trinity, is that there is healing spells in the game, but generally you take care of yourself. The gameplay is reliant on you be observant of the enemy, and the bosses get really, really cool. Observing what they do, kind of understanding what they're going to do, dangerous attacks and things like that, and then managing not to sort of commit yourself to an attack that's going to get you killed. Now, if you do take damage, which is inevitable, you have two healing potions, one that gives you a percentage of your HP, and then heal over time. And But with those... I have to say, we, we you do feel kind of invincible. Like, you have to kind of screw up quite, kind of badly to die. Um, I would love... Uh, like this goes back to the leveling experience. I would really love to see a little bit more of engaging threat um, during that experience. Because you do feel pretty invincible. I was never afraid of jumping into a giant pack. Unlike you would see in a Diablo or a Path of Exile, the mobs don't carry things like Reflect. They don't carry weaknesses and bonuses to certain damage types. Uh, they don't carry those sort of augments that make them a little bit more wary, a bit more afraid. And certain enemies, you've got, really got to be careful because they explode on death and things like that. The enemies don't carry that kind of stuff. So it does feel a little on the simple side until you get to endgame and we'll get there later. It would have been nice to have more threat, more danger, at least if it was choice. Because there are rare mobs and world bosses in the area uh, while you're leveling. But they, similar to what I was saying about the XP, they kind of feel like a bit of a waste of time, which is a little unfortunate. The world boss, for example, that I bumped into in my sort of early level 20s or mid-level 20s, it took me 20 minutes to kill it with a group of people. Like, it was a tremendous amount of health, and it was really fun. It wasn't particularly dangerous. I had to be play a little careful, but with healing potions, I could just kind of move out the fight for a little bit, heal up, come back into it. The way aggro seems to work, because there's no tanks or anything, is the bosses tend to cycle through everybody who's attacking it and kind of focus on them for a period of time so you do have to deal with like the enemy coming for you and then it'll move on to somebody else so it generally kind of worked that way there are tankier classes there are healing classes uh but you do have opportunities to just kind of move away strengthen back up come back in unfortunately the killing the world boss after like 20 minutes didn't reward me with much xp 
uh, and, you know, loot that I would replace very, very quickly because you're in the leveling process. So it kind of felt like a waste of time, which I wish it didn't because I was very excited about it. And endgame, it's more important, but it would have been nice to have some more robust experience gain from doing that. Uh, similar with the rare mobs. The rare mobs do drop a couple of uh, chances at gear and some extra resources, but you'll find that later on, quests just give so much more. So you might get something like 10 or 20 rapport items, where you get a 1,000 later on. Uh, things like that. And I want to get off... <laughs> the gameplay's so good! My gameplay's so good that I do want to get off and go and smash some rare mobs and deal with some more difficult enemies. Uh, which is, again, it feels like it's almost a waste of time other than just getting on with uh, questing and doing things like that. But the dungeons, especially... As I did the first one, each one got progressively better. Uh, until I, we started getting multi-phase enemies, so you can't just blitz them down. Uh, and they become much more fast and much more... Uh, committed. I will say in terms of the gameplay, what I found is because you can respect what, however you want to do, whenever you want to do, I found myself rebuilding my character depending on what I was doing. So out in the open world, I could drag enemies together, I could do massive crushing blows and huge setups. Whereas when I was dealing with raid bosses, uh, big bosses and things like that, I actually wanted to set up combos that were more instant cast and fast. So that reason is I don't want to animation lock my character because there are some abilities that my character has, such as plunging his sword into the ground and doing massive damage uh, if I hold it for like three or four seconds. A boss could target me with a, an ability and hit me before I get that ability off, especially if I haven't got my dodge roll available, uh, which means that using that ability is really dangerous. So what I found myself doing was building combos so I could get in and do these massive bursts of damage while still then being able to drop back and relax, which is fine. I had no issue with that at all. Creating these huge burst windows was really satisfying. And it allowed me to play the, the fight better, understand my positioning, and really focus on that stuff. So that came with super fun. The dungeons were a massive highlight for me. One thing that wasn't, though, was the stronghold. Now, I was certainly looking forward to this. Your stronghold is your own personal island, essentially, a tropical paradise, uh, where after, certainly I've probably been influenced a little bit by FF14 here, is I was really looking forward to seeing what kind of levels of customization, decoration, and things like that. This was the most mobile game-centric element uh, that I found, and it's certainly what I mentioned in the intro about having multiple alts. Uh, your stronghold is designed in order to complete missions and research, and very quickly, once you get there, you realize that it's very similar to what you'd see in mobile games, which is you click research or craft, and a timer appears, and then you can pay coins and resources that you do gather in-game, by the way, uh, in order to finish that more quickly, uh, because it'll be like two hours, two days, you know, things like that that pop up. And I left the stronghold pretty quickly. It was actually one of the more disappointing elements for me because I was so excited for it. But I got there, I was like, oh, it's one of these kind of things. Yeah, I <laughs> just kind of left. I really wish the stronghold would get, would lose that mobile element of it because I was genuinely excited to get there to just mess around with it and have some fun with it. Especially because you do get like an entire Tropico style island. Uh, but I didn't quite get where I wanted it to be, uh, which was a bit of a shame. That was the most like... <laughs> Nah, I don't like this. This is this is me going to be dropping out of there, you know? That's not going to really work out for me. Um, but that does bring us to the sea travel. Like I mentioned earlier, the game opened up and you do get a boat where you have to traverse this giant map and start uncovering islands and mysteries and things like that. And that's when the game really started to open up for me and became very, 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 very interesting. Like, at that point, I was like, okay... Weird things are going on over here. There's treasure to be found in the sea, like uh, Wind Waker. Uh, and now I can have a lot of fun. I spent a lot of time just sailing around to see what mysteries uh, were beholden across the entire area. Let's go to the end game then. So, Mr. Keggers, uh, who is um, uh, sort of not resident, but very, very ARPG focused player with thousands of hours in all of them. And has always played the end game there. I trust his opinion very, very, very well on these kinds of things. He was the one who went over to the end game. One of the things. <laughs> that uh, I've mentioned several times now is during the leveling experience you don't really get besides the very odd occasion that experience that you would get in a Path of Exile or a Diablo where you have a hundred enemies and you get to really let your class fly you tend to deal with four or five sometimes a few more but rarely uh, of killing a few enemies and then you kind of go about your business what you want and we all crave when playing a game especially with the gameplay as satisfying as Lost Ark is that opportunity to really unleash your fury and just take on swathes of mobs and really kick some ass. Uh, that does not happen during the leveling experience and rarely happens in the open world. It does happen, though, at endgame, especially in its chaos dungeons. The, you, these are going to seem very familiar to you if you play Diablo 3 Rifts. You have a timer 
and you're going to get these big bosses. You're going to be going, you're going to be stretching the legs of your character as to how powerful it is, and you're going to be mowing down hundreds and hundreds of enemies. And I'm sure you can see on the screen right now how satisfying that looks and how meaty that looks in order to generate that kind of gameplay. So it does exist, it's just going to be at the end game, and I would have loved to have seen that much earlier on. Uh, there's a couple of things like the castle scenario where they will give you like a hundred enemies to plow through and that moment is like really good want that more uh, especially with, it's not hard to level in this game you can level super super fast but i would love to see that more in the open world that would have been really cool but it is waiting for you end game it is there did not get a chance to try the raids out have investigated it a little bit works similar to dungeons really fun really bombastic lots of things to uh, dodge and move out of the way of and manage yourself which is essentially the aim of the game especially in the big pve content is managing all that process of looking after yourself similar to what you'll find in the chaos the chaos dungeons that you'll find at the end game farming for that big gear obviously resource collection is everything in order to upgrade your gear get it stronger and do all that kind of things as well as mixed in with the fashion stuff so that is our overall view in it i am really impressed by this game really impressed from a gameplay standpoint and i think when it comes out Remember, it is free to play. Yeah, it's well worth an investment. I found I found nothing I would ever invest a penny into. Uh, I bought I would buy some skins like I did with Path of Exile. I'm more than happy to pick up skins for a really good free to play game. I'm more than happy to spend some money as I would do to play any ordinary game uh, in order to just show the spot because it's really good. It's really good, and I just I, as I said earlier, I just don't think it needs this weight hanging over it because they have a really really good solid fun game here. And it's blighted at the moment with this silly thing of resources and gear upgrading, which I just don't think they need. And there you have it, guys. That is our thoughts on Lost Ark from me and the team. The beta is closing. I've seen several people wanting to go and play on the Russian service so they can keep playing. It's a fantastically fun game. There's no getting away from that. No amount of argument and war is going to make that. And so far, I can see no reason why you have to spend any money on this game. But undoubtedly the game would be better if that temptation wasn't there because there are those people who are tempted and those people who can't resist and that's the stuff i don't like other than that i'll see you again soon because we're going to be looking at warframe they want us to check out that game and see what their new player experience is like and not only that i have been set a challenge can i learn magic the gathering in about four hours and then actually beat a player at it stay tuned for that one bye guys